Major allergies today. Major allergies, everybody. Can barely breathe. Um, I To get a flight that should have taken only three hours, it yesterday... God, I'm just launching right into it. Yesterday, there was a flight that took... It was basically like I went to Australia, when really I just went to two major cities in the United States. It was insane. Um... I didn't get home until 4 a.m., I believe. And so right now it's 5 p.m. on Saturday, and I feel like it's 8 a.m. I mean, I'm just completely confused and a mess. Um, I'm not a total mess. I mean, I'm okay, but I do, I am just wiped out. And also, um, when we were taking off, there was a girl behind me in a middle seat who threw up all over the place all over the place um it was i don't want to get into too many details but trust me it was gross it brought back a memory of the reason i quit girl scouts or brownies i don't remember if i ever made it into girl scouts i believe i was maybe always just a brownie but anyway i was always a little bit nervous actually a lot nervous of spending the night at other people's houses it always made me very scared and so, but this was camp for brownies and it was a traditional camp, like in a big log cabin. And I, at night we all lined up our sleeping bags and everybody's sleeping bags were in these rows, but we were head to head and foot to foot. So my head on my sleeping bag, about a foot behind me was another girl's head. And I had very long, luxurious hair as a child. And it was probably, you know, I was always hot. My neck was always hot, even back then. So I had lifted my hair up as I always did. So, you know, if you drew a picture of me from straight on, it looked like I had hair standing like, you know, three feet above my head. So anyway, you get the idea. My head, my hair was in that middle space between me and the other girl. Well, I go to sleep, surprisingly, without crying my head off, wanting my mommy, because I was a little baby. <laughs> um... And I woke up to the feeling of somebody touching my hair. And then I felt water. I was like, and I kind of like looked up and there was a woman with a bucket of water washing my hair while I was asleep because the girl behind me threw up all over my hair. And um, I don't know what came first, my fear of throwing up or that. I'm pretty sure my fear of throwing up had already happened. So for those of you that don't know, I threw up in a restaurant, Godfather's Pizza, in um, second grade in Omaha, Nebraska. And it changed my life in a really serious way. I'm not trying to be cute or exaggerating. Because from then on, I never ate in a restaurant again for the rest of my life until I was 18 years old. From second grade all the way until I was um, graduating as a senior, I'd never ate in a restaurant. I would go into restaurants, but I would only draw. Because I threw up in this restaurant in front of this little kid and the parents and I just like had a mental breakdown, basically. It was very, very, very traumatizing for me. And it also established this long-standing horrible thing I have of like anything human about me I'm slightly disgusted by, if that makes sense. Or I thought being human was disgusting, which is really sad and uh, something that I still have to work on. But anyway, so I, th I was so scared every night that I was going to throw up that I started to collect the fuzz from my blanket that I slept with. It was like a Native American patterned blanket that back in the day we called our Indian blanket. It was the softest blanket in the whole world, and I loved it so much. And I would, um, you know, pick at it. You know how you pick at a sweater? And, you, and I started a ball that night, a little ball out of it, and I slept with it in my hands. And... Um, Slowly but surely, every night of my life, for all that time, I made this ball and ended up being big. And I have photographic photographic proof. Uh, photographic proof. I might have an old blog post that I, I'll put it in a link. I, let me remember. Hold on. Let me get my notepad. I'll put in a link. I'll remember to tell you guys uh, the... It's called the Uff Ball. My brother also picked off the fuzz from this blanket. We called them Uffies, singular. And it was an Uff Ball. But my brother, rather than making a ball, this was for nap time for him. He would make a little mini ball with about eight of the individual fuzz balls and <laughs> stick them in his ear or up his nostril, just a little bit. Like it would just kind of 
right there, right on the tip of his nostril. So you could kind of see him as he inhaled and exhaled. It would sort of move with the uh, with his breath. It was very, very serious business in the O'Neill family there. Um, but why am I talking about this? Oh, so anyway, I still very much fear throwing up. And truly, since that night at Godfather's, I've only thrown up about uh, five or six times and I'm 42 years old, I really will do anything to make sure I don't throw up. And luckily, as many health problems as I have, I don't, I'm not one of those people who just throws up all the time. There's a lot of those people I know. My old friend Lindsay used to love throwing up, I remember. She would make herself throw up, but not in a bulimic way, just like if she wasn't feeling well, she's like, well, I better go throw up, get it over with. And I was always so unbelievably shocked. Hold on, I need to take a drink of my decaf. Anyway, um, the, the fear of throwing up is very real with me, within me. And recently I was in a Walmart, Walmart parking lot and this girl opened up. I, it was just like horrible timing on my part, walking past the cars towards the Walmart because my new obsession is this Walmart near where I live. I don't know how to describe it to you, but I swear to God, I just want to move into the fucking building and take up residence there. I, I could go on and on. I should do a whole podcast about this Walmart, but anyway, um, right as I'm walking past this car, this girl opens up the door, the passenger door, and throws up all over the place. And my stomach hurt, and I, like, for hours later, and I had to, like, I have to hold my face, close my eyes, hold my head, and, like, try to get that image out of my fucking brain, or I will think I'm gonna throw up. And that's how I was as a kid. Anytime anybody else threw up, I thought that meant I was gonna throw up. And I would have to do all these, and this is actually why I draw a lot. So when I had to go to restaurants with my family, the main thing was like my mom always brought paper and a pen or a pencil. And I would just look down. I wouldn't look at food. I wouldn't look at anybody. And I would just draw. Um, anyway, how do you guys feel about throwing up? You cool with it? You hate it? You love it? Who, I mean, if you love it, honestly, I don't understand you. That It is the, <laughs> but more power to you, man. I wish I loved it too. Um, I haven't asked you guys good questions in a while, have I? Who is your favorite person in the entire world? You can, I think you should answer that as somebody you know, somebody you actually have known throughout your life. But they could be dead, but just somebody you've actually known. So it can't be like Charlie Chaplin or Greta Gerwig or who else is a person? Gandhi. Unless you happen to know any of those people. Um, how about your least favorite person you've ever met? What if I just opened up with it and it was somebody, somebody you guys could look up and stuff? Well, they are that person, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. But anyway, this person was a real asshole. Um, how about nachos? What do you think about nachos? Do you want me to make you some nachos one day? If I do ever do a me reading stuff event, I do think I should make nachos for everybody. Remember, uh, I make nachos. Each individual chip is taken care of specifically and uh, gracefully. So if it's like refried beans and cheese and uh, green onions, let's say, each chip, I take a knife to the refried beans and carefully put it on the chip. This, this is not a pile of chips with a bunch of stuff on top. Every chip is taken care of. No child is left behind. Um, other questions. Are you hypercritical of others? Be honest with yourself. And are you hypercritical of yourself? I am not at all hypercritical of others. This is, uh, like, really not at all. Um, but I am hypercritical of myself. I used to be more critical of others. Uh, but not anymore. I don't have time for that. I, I don't, I don't have, and it's also just rude. Let's face it. Does, is anybody who's hypercritical of others a cool person? <laughs> no. Uh, that's an asshole thing to be, but it's also an asshole thing to be hypercritical of yourself. Um, how about your parents? Are you hypercritical of them? I am not hypercritical of my parents at all. I just fucking love my parents. Um, I'm sure I could sit around and come up with things to be mad at them for all the time, but I'm just not going to do that. They gave me the gift of life, <laughs> which I used to hate. I was mad at them for that for years, but I got over that. Um... Let's see. I guess that's it for the questions, you guys. Uh, thank you for listening, by the way. This is me reading stuff. I'm Robin O'Neill. You can check me out on Instagram and Twitter at R-O-B-Y-N underscore O-N-E-I-L. I have some upcoming shows. Yay! If you're in San Antonio, I'm in a show at the new Ruby City 
That opens, let me pull up my calendar, October something. October 12th, I believe, is the public opening. I'll be giving a talk that afternoon. Look up Ruby City on Google and you'll find that information. Maybe I'll put the link in the description of the podcast. And a little bit more excitingly, only because it's uh, 20 years of my work. Fort Worth, Texas, the modern, sorry, the modern in Fort Worth is uh, exhibiting 20 years of my work. It'll be open until about February, I believe. So if you've ever been curious about seeing my work in person, this is your chance. You can see pretty much everything I've ever made, and I want you guys to go. I recommend. I, I think it's highly worth the trip. I'll just say it. And I also have a pop-up shop with all of my crocheted items and woven items. So anyway, that opens. Um, the public opening is October, I think, the 18th. All the other like private openings are all that week. And there's a public event on the 15th of October, Tuesday, That is when I will be giving a talk with Tyler Green of Modern Art Notes. If you guys are art nerds, you know all about Modern Art Notes, and we'll be giving a lecture on skies in art history. All right, enough about me. Let's get to the reading. I mentioned last week that Mary Rufel was on the new Bookworm um, with Michael Silverblatt, podcast radio show that I love so, so much, and it was a very, very... I loved this interview. I mean, Michael Silverblatt's always good. And Mary Rufel's always good, but the combo of those two was really killer, especially in this episode, because I just liked, I liked Mary so much, uh, some things she was saying, like apparently, did I already tell you guys this? It's, it's a considered offensive or it's inappropriate now to ask where someone is from. Now you may disagree with me. I think that is ridiculous. You... That is a curiosity question. If I ask someone where they're from, that does not mean I think that they're different. Oh my God, you're so different. Where the fuck are you from? Like, if you said it like that, well then, yeah, that would be rude. But if you're like, interesting, where are you guys from then? Like, if they tell you a story and you ask, oh, where are you from? Like, you know, someone's telling you something they ate as a child or whatever. You can't ask where... Anyway, this is part of curriculum at a lot of uh, universities, apparently. Now, I'm, I don't know. I'm just telling you, I think that's awful. But anyway, she went into a whole kind of, not a tirade, but an, an interesting discussion about how, you know, we also aren't about place anymore. You know, you can, we don't call a phone and know we're calling somebody in Des Moines, Iowa. We are calling somebody and they could be anywhere in the world. Or you could email with somebody for years and have no clue where they even live. And how bizarre that is, how that makes us kind of a part of the ether. So anyway, that's the kind of stuff Mary Rufel was talking about. But her new book, hold on, let me go grab it. All right, new book from, I told you the other week, Wave. Wave Books. This is Wave Books 078. This is called Dunce by Mary Rufel. Their books are so goddamn beautiful. And... I can't recommend, just go to their website. You'll see what I mean. And, and just like start, I would just order a random, a book at random. I really, truly would. And you kind of can't go wrong with them. Wavepoetry.com. This is copyright 2019. And this says for Joshua Beckman. I always like to read that stuff. Um, you know what? Give me a minute. I'm not sure which one I want to read. And I, I do, again, I recommend ordering this from Wave Books. So one second while I pick out which one I want to read for you. Okay, this was hard to choose, but I'm going to choose Long White Cloud just because I'm always thinking about clouds and um, the, yeah, because this is really, really good. I'll probably end up reading another one at random at the end here. I've said random way too many times in the last 10 minutes. I apologize about that. Long White Cloud by Mary Rufel. How did the bare-bummed child crawling on the beach in a pink sunbonnet learn how to walk by watching seagulls? How did my mother decide to marry my father by buffing her nails, then staring at her hands? How did so many unpronounceable words come into being? And how many more words whose meanings are unclear or obscure? Why do seagulls cry while land birds sing? How did the agitator of the soul become himself so violently agitated? How could someone crying out, a cloud, a white cloud, a long white cloud, be naming a country. A country is not a cloud. A cloud is not a country. 
Only the agitator of the soul would have you believe it. Seabirds cry to be heard over the waves. Landbirds sing to let everyone know. A silky cornel of red osier makes good kinny kinnick. My mother gave simple advice to all. Do not grow up to become a baby. And the baby stood, and the baby took a step, and then another. And the seagull scattered into a cloud, a white cloud, a long white cloud. And the baby cried, to be heard over the land of the living. Hmm. There you go. Take that book. Take that, America. Take that, birds. Take that, Kinney Kinnick some sort of Native American smoking thing. I had to look it up. I really did. I had no idea what that was. And so I uh, had, I love looking up name pronunciations. Let's see if I can find where I did that. Um, let me see. Anyway, I like, I like hearing that. Let me see if I can find it in the history. Pronounce Kenny Kinnick. And I knew that because I had a cat named Kenny. Okay, here. I mean, I, I wrote it down as Kenny. Kenny Kinnick. Kenny Kinnick. Kenny Kinnick. Kinney Kinnick. That's good. I happen to know what Osier was, which is, uh, Osier is spelled, I think, O, what is it? O-S-I-E-R. I knew that was a tree. Kinney Kinnick. Kinney Kinnick. I feel like I'm being a little annoying here. Um, which, hey, that's the real me. Sometimes, sometimes I'm annoying. I want to read you one more. Let's just go. Should I do random? I heard, I heard a yes. All right, let's do, ooh, I saw one called. Hold up. Where is it? I think we all need to learn about this one. Patience. I haven't read this one yet. I just got this book today. I've seen her walking the streets in her green coat, head down, hair blown back. I've seen the dogs straining at leashes in search of her. Her perfume is death, a black silhouette. In May, she straightens up, shortcuts through the hotel lobby, losing her scarf, which was strangling her. And then I lost her. But wait, summer, my God, here she comes, floating on air. I can only imagine what she's been through, reeking like that of gardenia. Mary Rufel's good. What do you know? Um, ooh, there's one called Halloween that I haven't read yet. We'll read that near Halloween. All right, so this is Dunce by Mary Rufel. I highly recommend the bookworm interview with Mary Rufel uh, from a couple weeks back. And what else do I want to say? Take a breath. Take a breath, Robin. I don't take enough deep breaths. I'll tell you that right now. I want to say thank you to everybody who subscribes and tells their friends. I want to thank you and answer a question to my newest five-star review from Sarah. Sarah. Sarah wrote so many nice things on iTunes, a five-star review, and she did ask me a question. Also, I want to report her mental health right now is an 8.5. Hell yeah, Sarah. Very, very, very good for you. Um, all right, so she asked, you mentioned you love San Antonio. What are some of the things you love about the place? Um, and she said she's looking for, hey, going to come to the Fort Worth show, Sarah. I love that. Come and say hello to me, please, and thank you. What I love about San Antonio is... Pretty much the breakfast tacos. I'll be honest with you. People in the West Coast think they know what bre breakfast tacos are, but they don't. Um, it's Austin and San Antonio that knows about breakfast tacos. And those of you who live there know what I'm talking about. Those of you that do not have no clue what you're talking about, and you do need to visit San Antonio specifically has the best breakfast tacos, I think. Um, so that's one thing I love about San Antonio. I also just love the size of San Antonio. I think it's a perfectly sized city. And I'll be honest with you, the Riverwalk. What's not to love about the fucking Riverwalk? It's, it's gorgeous. It's cool. The Alamo, missions, the history of San Antonio, um, the people of San Antonio, the fact that Art Pace exists and now Ruby City's opening up. Uh, I lived in San Antonio for three months and... I do consider it some of the best times of my life. I remember I brought with me, Martha Stewart um, used to have these littler magazines called Everyday Food. And they were mini magazines, like the size of a Reader's Digest. And every page was a great recipe. And I took about five of them with me and went through them. 
the whole time I lived there, I got to I I made a point to make as many of those things as possible. One of the best being the crab cakes. And I lost those books, or somebody made me get rid of them. And I am very sad about that, because those were my favorites. If anyone knows where I can find the back issues of Everyday Food by Martha Stewart, please let me know, because I miss those so much that it almost makes me cry. I really do. But anyway, thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, taking the time. And again, back to Josh Garvelink. I love that last name, Garvelink. Josh Garvelink, uh, for your amazing question about GTS. I'm st I just, oh my God, I just picked up Josh. I just picked up, I think it was how many, maybe 12, 14 new lemonade kombuchas. And it made me so happy. And they gave me a free carrying case at the grocery store. Like one of those that people usually use for wine, but they filled up the wine carrying case and they didn't make me even buy it. Oh, but Josh, I also bought, um, Recently, I had the cyanide. It sounds like cyanide. I got the cyanide flavor of uh, GTS kombucha, and oh my god, I loved it. I used it like a non-alcoholic cocktail. I put it on ice, and I was like blown away by how much I like it. So anyway, thank you to all of you guys. I'm going on way too long, but I love you very much. Sorry I got stuck in Chicago. I wasn't able to do my podcast in time. I'm so sorry. The weather was insane. It was also beautiful. I loved everything about it, except that it was keeping me from traveling, but I could not get a podcast out on Thursday, but that's what I'm here for today. I love you. I love you. I love you. Be good to yourself. Don't be hypercritical to yourselves and eat some nachos for God's sake. Now get the fuck out of here.